possible. First, I've repeatedly voiced Russia's official stance. Iran has the right to a peaceful nuclear program, and it can't be singled out for discrimination. Second, we need to be aware that Iran is located in a very challenging region. I've told our Iranian partners about that. That's why Iranian threats made towards neighboring countries, in particular Israel, threats that Israel can be destroyed, are absolutely unacceptable. This is counterproductive. This is not a proper quote of the Iranian president. It doesn't quite matter whether it's a proper quote or not. It means it's best to avoid a wording that could be improperly quoted or could be interpreted differently. That's why the focus on Iran does have a reason behind it. I have no doubts that Iran is compliant with the rules, simply because there's no proof of the opposite. According to the latest IAEA report, Iran has been abiding by the commitments it has taken up. True, there are some outstanding issues, but with due patience and friendly attitudes, they can be resolved. I have a great respect for Iran and a great interest in it. This is a great country indeed. You don't often hear this attitude mentioned in relation to Iran, but it's true. This is a country with a great culture, a great history, and is a great nation. They're very proud of their country. They have their own understanding of their place, both in the region and in the world, and that's something you have to respect. You've grasped the core of the problem. Iranians are very smart and cunning politicians. And to a certain degree, they have exploited this confrontation with the United States. They are not the only ones. They're extremely crafty in this, and they do it to tackle their domestic political issues. When there's an external enemy, it united the nation. But I guess the United States have been employing the same technique. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, there have been no external threats that would allow Washington to dominate the West. There must be a threat so that the US can protect their allies from it. This position yields political and economic benefits. If everyone relies on one country for protection, then this country is entitled to some preferential treatment. So it's very important to possess this status of a global defender, to be able to resolve issues even beyond the realm of foreign policy and security issues. I think the U.S. has been using Iran for this very purpose, that it is to unite their allies in the shadow of a real or false threat. It's quite a complicated issue, but it's not an issue for Russia. We've been complying with our international commitments, including on Iran's peaceful nuclear program. As you know, Russia built the Boucher power plant in Iran. We've completed this project and are prepared for further cooperation. Yet when we proposed to enrich uranium on Russian territory, our Iranian partners refused for reasons unknown to us. They argue that they will enrich uranium on their own, in line with existing international regulation. And as I said earlier, if they don't break any rules, they're fully entitled to do that. We will endorse this right, but we will also remain aware of the concerns that other states and the international community has concerning full compliance with these rules. Can I clarify something? The thing is, I was asking you not only about the U.S.-Iranian relations, but also about the U.S.-Russian relations. Would you agree that we have fundamental ideological differences on key issues of international law? So right on the eve of my meeting with Barack Obama, you are pushing me to make some serious statements. It's a very important issue. If the country thinks it has more rights than others, I thought you wouldn't notice my deviation, but you did. Indeed, you are very persistent. To date, we don't have any significant ideological differences, but we have fundamental cultural differences. Individualism lies at the core of the American identity, while Russia has been a country of collectivism. One student of Pushkin's legacy has formulated this difference very aptly. Take Scarlett O'Hara from Gone with the Wind, for instance. She says, I'll never be hungry again. This is the most important thing for her. Russians have different, far loftier ambitions, more of a spiritual kind. It's more about your relationship with God. We have different visions of life. That's why it's very difficult to understand each other, but it's still possible. That's why there is international law to create a level playing field for everyone. The U.S. is a very democratic state, there's no doubt about that, and it originally developed as a democratic state. 
When the first settlers set their foot on the continent, life forced them to forge a relationship and maintain a dialogue with each other to survive. That's why America was initially conceived as a fundamental democracy. With that in mind, we should not forget that America's development began with a large-scale ethnic cleansing, unprecedented in human history. I wouldn't like to delve so deeply into it, but you're forcing me to do it. When Europeans arrived in America, that was the first thing they did. And you have to be honest about it. There are not so many stories like that in human history. Take the destruction of Carthage by the Roman Empire. The legend has it that Romans ploughed over and sowed the city with salt so that nothing will ever grow there. Europeans didn't use the salt because they used the land for agriculture, but they wiped out the indigenous population. Then there was slavery, and that's something that's deeply ingrained in America. In his memoirs, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell revealed how hard it was for him as a black man, how hard it was for him to live with other people staring at you. It means this mentality has taken root in the hearts and minds of the people and is likely to still be there. Now take the Soviet Union. We know a lot about Stalin now. We know him as a dictator and a tyrant. But still, I don't think that in the spring of 1945, Stalin would have used a nuclear bomb against Germany if he had one. He could have done it in 1941 or 1942, when it was a matter of life or death. But I really doubt that he would have done it in 1945, when the enemy had almost given up and had absolutely no chance to reverse the trend. I don't think he would. Now look at the US, they dropped the bomb on Japan, a country that was a non-nuclear state and was very close to defeat. So there are big differences between us, but it's quite natural that people with such differences are determined to find ways to understand each other better. I don't think there is an alternative. Moreover, it's not by chance that Russia and the US forged an alliance in the most critical moments of modern history. That was the case in World War I and World War II. Even if there was fierce confrontation, our countries united in the face of a common threat, which means there's something that unites us. There must be some fundamental interests that bring us together. That's something we need to focus on first. We need to be aware of our differences, but focus on a positive agenda that can improve our cooperation. America and Russia's relations with the U.S. are important issues for our network, largely because Americans make up most of our audience. If you simply look at our website's hit statistics, you'll see that most of our audience comes from America. So anything related to the U.S. is a key topic for us. And here is Anastasia Cherkina, who has specially come over from New York for this meeting. She works at our US-based channel, RT America, which caters to an American audience and focuses specifically on American issues. Is that right, Anastasia? Yes, thank you. I've lived in New York for the past five years. You have mentioned the fundamental differences as well as the common features that Russia shares with the United States. I would like to go back to our diplomatic relations and the present issues of international law. When I meet American politicians and Russia experts these days, I often hear them acknowledge off-record that the Magnitsky Act has effectively come to replace the jackson vanik Commandment, which demonstrates the same outdated approach towards Russia. As we know, when Barack Obama met with Mr. Medvedev during the summit in Seoul last year, he made some hints, saying he would have more flexibility after re-election. I see you guys just don't get off their backs, do you? This is the last question, I promise. This always happens. Obama hinted that it would be easier for him to cooperate with Russia. However, that is not what we are seeing today. We've already touched upon many of our remaining issues with the U.S. Why do you think the reset has not worked? And can it ever take place in the first place as an equal, reciprocal process? Or is it that Russia is always expected to sacrifice its national interest? Any state pursues its national interests, and the U.S. is no exception. What's unique here is that the collapse of the Soviet Union left America as the world's single leader. 
but there was a catch associated with it in that it began to view itself as an empire. But an empire is not only about foreign policy, it's also about domestic policies. An empire cannot afford to display weakness, and any attempt to strike an agreement on equitable terms is often seen domestically as weakness. But the leadership cannot afford to display weakness due to domestic policy considerations. I think that the current administration realizes that it cannot solve the world's major issues on its own. But first, they still want to do it. And second, they can only take steps that are fit for an empire. Domestic policy considerations play a huge role. Otherwise, you would be accused of weakness. In order to act otherwise, you either have to win overwhelming support or there must be a chance in mentality. When people will understand that it's much more beneficial to look for compromises than to impose your will on everyone. But it certainly takes time to change those patterns of thinking in any country. In this case, it's the US. First and foremost, this change should take place in the minds of the ruling elite, in the broad sense of this phrase. I don't think that it's impossible. I think we've almost come to that point. I very much hope we'll reach it soon. Thank you, Mr. Putin.